Hi YouTube, in this video I will be attempting to answer some questions that were recently posed to me in a live chat. Apparently people with no experience or background in space technology and who have done no research at all into the subject are spotting engineering problems with spacesuits that have remained unnoticed for over 50 years. Such as, why don't spacesuits expand like a balloon in space? Were the Gemini and Apollo spacesuits tested in a vacuum? And we're going to start by taking a look at Ed White's Gemini 4 spacewalk. On June the 3rd, 1965, Ed White opened the hatch of his Gemini 4 spacecraft and used a handheld manoeuvring oxygen jet gun to push himself out of the capsule. He turns his head and waves towards the camera. The claim is made that his helmet should not turn in this way. As we can see, this is very obviously not the case. Ed White is wearing a G4C spacesuit manufactured by the David Clark Company of Massachusetts and a helmet made by BF Goodrich. A long underwear type garment with biomedical sensors was worn under the spacesuit. The suit itself consisted of a number of layers as follows. A comfort layer made from nylon oxford material. The innermost layer made the suit easier to get on and off and increased comfort for the astronaut by reducing contact with the harder sections of the suit. A pressure container made from neoprene coated nylon, an inflatable man-shaped bladder that could be pressurised when necessary. This diagram shows how oxygen was distributed through the pressure container layer. The restraining layer, a net which tightly covered the pressure bladder preventing it from ballooning or changing shape when the astronaut moved, making the suit more flexible. The net consisted of woven cords of Dacron and Teflon and was patented under the name LinkNet by the David Clark Company. It can be seen here exposed on a glove. Being slightly smaller than the pressure bladder, the restraining layer reduced the stiffness of the suit when pressurised and served as a sort of structural shell, much like a tyre contains the pressure load of an inner tube. Improved arm and shoulder mobility resulted from the multi-layer design of the Gemini suit. Suits designed for EVA included multiple layers of thermal and micrometeoroid protection. Mylar was used for thermal protection and layers of HT1 fabric, now known as Nomex, and ballistic felt were initially used for protection against micrometeoroid impact. This was replaced on later missions by a single layer of neoprene coated nylon. An outer layer of HT1 fabric, the fire resistant outer layer protected the inner layers from damage and would help protect an astronaut ejecting through a ball of ignited rocket fuel. This layer was white to reflect sunlight and heat. Some early training versions of the suit had an aluminised outer layer similar to the Project Mercury spacesuit, but the final versions used on all flights had the white outer layer. The Clark suit was adapted to use the helmet designed by BF Goodrich, a removable fibreglass helmet which connected via a locking ring to the suit. The ring had rotating bearings, allowing the astronaut to turn his head from side to side. The helmet was lined and padded for comfort and protection and contained communications equipment, earphone and microphone, and an oral thermometer for monitoring the astronaut's temperature. The retractable visor, which became pressure sealed when closed, was initially made of plexiglass. This was replaced with polycarbonate on later missions. A portion of the helmet below the visor allowed the attachment of a water nozzle so the astronaut could drink while the suit was pressurised and the visor was closed. Pressurised gloves attached to the suit via locking rings at the cuffs of the suit. On some flights, small battery operated lights were added to the backs of two fingers. Boots, also pressurised, were integrated into the suits for EVA, but were removable on IVA only suits. As we have seen, the Gemini helmet was designed to move from side to side, and the suit included a restraining layer which prevented it from ballooning. I stumbled across this meme while I was researching this video, so just to respond, yes, seriously! Pressure sealing zippers were first patented in the 1940s for use in aircraft. The design was modified multiple times and we can see here the patent when minor changes were made to the zipper design in preparation for the Apollo missions in 1968. 
The Gemini suits were extensively tested and here we can see a copy of the original testing schedule which details multiple vacuum chamber tests amongst many others. For the Apollo missions, a number of manufacturers competed to make the spacesuits. Each suit underwent 65 separate tests. All of the suits we can see here were rejected. Only three suits made it through all the tests. The suit finally selected was the AX-5L, eventually called the A-7L, manufactured by ILC Dover, a division of Playtex, who were chosen for the high quality workmanship of their seamstresses and the unique flexible rubber concertina sections at the joints of the pressure garment, which allowed the astronaut much greater mobility. The A-7L consisted of a constant wear garment for comfort, a liquid cooling garment which removed the astronaut's body heat, a pressure garment assembly which like the Gemini suit utilised a nylon restraining layer to maintain its shape and included the bubble helmet with visor assembly and gloves. The helmet differed in design from the Gemini helmet in that it locked in place and allowed the astronaut's head to turn inside it. It also had a drinking port. The outermost layer of the suit was a thermal meteoroid garment to protect the astronaut from impact of tiny meteoroids. There were also overgloves and boots for EVA activity, a fact which as we can see was somehow missed during the extensive flat earth research into this subject. The boots that were part of the pressure garment assembly had velcro patches on the sole to help the astronaut grip to the velcroed floor of the lunar module. The lunar overboots that produced the footprint can be seen here. Again, the Apollo suits were rigorously tested for mobility and durability, and extensive efforts were made to replicate the lunar environment. This included heat and vacuum chamber testing. NASA even built the Space Environmental Simulation Laboratory, which included the huge Chamber A, the largest vacuum chamber in the world, so that they could test the entire Apollo service and command module, including a fully suited crew, in a vacuum at high and low temperature extremes. The two TV-1 tests took place on June 16, 1968. Astronauts Joe Kerwin, Vance Brand and Joe Engel spent a full week living inside the command module inside Chamber A in a dress rehearsal of an Apollo mission. A similar test of the lunar module, known as LT-8, was conducted in Chamber B around the same time. These are just two of the many, many tests that were conducted on spacecraft and spacesuits. As with my previous videos, all the information I have given here is readily available at no cost. If you have an interest in this subject and you are making technical claims about the specifications of spacesuits, then you should have some basis for those claims. If your chosen profession is solar panel salesman, for instance, then you should expect there to be some aspects of spacesuit construction that you are ignorant of. You can research in order to answer your questions as I have, and then if you feel the explanations are unsatisfactory, you can give your reasons why. Pretending these questions have no answers when you are presenting them in a debate is a dishonest argument from ignorance. Hope you enjoyed watching, please rate, comment and subscribe.